we are starting the third and final week of the fast. Can I get an amen? I was going to say, can I get a Paco's Tacos? But no, we're not. We've got one more week. You know, hey, this fast has been good. It's been challenging. It's been hard. And we have one week left. We believe in the spiritual discipline and practice of fasting and praying, right? Uh, fasting is oftentimes something that's forgotten, pushed aside in our Christian faith. But we decided years ago as a church, we wanted to be a church that embraced the hard things. We wanted to be a church that embraced the truth of the word of God. And we wanted to follow the pattern of the life that Jesus lived, right? I mean, as Christians, we're pretty simple people. If Jesus did it, then it's good enough for us, right? And as Jesus modeled fasting in his own life, fasting 40 days in the wilderness before he's tempted by Satan, we as followers of Jesus say, yeah, it's difficult, it's challenging. Yeah, we want a Portillo's combo dipped. But we know that even though our stomachs are hungry, we're hungrier for God. And so we take this time of fasting, believing that the church that stands before you today is a church that's here as a community because of pressing into God. It's not because of just resources. It's not just because of leadership. But we believe that this is a church at the center of our church is a passionate, fiery hot pursuit of knowing God more. And as we jump into our last week of the fast, I know some of us have struggled this past week, maybe even blown it, but I want to encourage you before we step in, what I'm going to be talking about today is finishing the fast strong. And if you haven't even fasted with us in the last two weeks, don't worry, because I'm going to encourage you to jump on this last week, even if it's only for a few days, we're a church that believes in the power of fasting and prayer. Father, we pray this morning and ask that you would guide and lead us. We love you, Jesus, we do. Our heart is to know you more. And we know that there's nothing that compares to knowing you, nothing. And so as we go through our lives, we go through this season, there's things that on our heart that during this fast we're bringing before you, there's a fire that we wanna turn up even in our own life. And as you've seen us fasting over the last two weeks, have you seen us pressing in, Father? We ask that you'd give us the strength, the perseverance, the will to be able to finish this fast in a strong way, that you would allow us to push in, and through that, this church would experience another fire and passion for you that maybe we haven't even tapped into yet. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. Tune in with me, listen to these words. There's a couple words in this passage where Jesus is speaking to us on very key and important things in Matthew chapter 6. There's several words that he repeats over and over and over again. And as I read this passage, and it's a little bit of a longer uh, chunk of scripture here, I want you to identify the patterns in some of these words that Jesus is saying because the message today is going to be based out of those patterns. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. When you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in their synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give, he's talking about followers of Jesus, but when you give, give to the needy. Do not let your left hand know your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Have you seen a little bit of pattern of a couple words here? Let me, let me kind of help you with some of these. See, reward, and when. Let's keep going. And 
when you praise, we talked about giving. Now he's going to go to the next thing. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. You see the pattern here? He's giving us an action to do. He's saying, when you do this, when you give, when you pray, don't do it like a hypocrite. Don't do it like a phony. Do it this way instead. And last but not least, he finishes. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you fast, come on church, hear it. Anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Jesus uses these three key words seven times over in these short verses. He's trying to establish a pattern, convey a truth, that there's different ways of doing things. There's right and wrong. And he's bringing these patterns, and I'm not going to focus on giving in prayer. Today, as we're in a fast, I'm going to focus on fasting but I really believe in this passage, there's a lot of truth to help you and I in this last week finish the fast strong. So if you're taking notes and you want to finish this fast strong with me and as a church, write this down. Number one, God expects my fast. God expects my fast. Seven times in this passage, Jesus says, when you. He doesn't say, if you pray, and if you feel like giving. He says, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. See, what Jesus is trying to help us understand is these are three core disciplines of our faith that allow us to go deeper with Jesus, allow us to press into God, and that our Father in heaven is watching all of our actions. He's saying these are three things that need to be part of your life. They can't just be seasonal like a shamrock shake at McDonald's. I'm just trying to get you hungry a little bit, that's all. Our, our, our prayer, come on, hear me this morning. Our, our prayer can't just come at moments when we're in need, and then outside of that, we don't pray much because we're saying, God, you're kind of more like a genie to me. I just kind of talk to you when I need to. No, no, no. Prayer is an ongoing conversation with God, not just seasonal, it's a lifestyle thing. I love when I talk to people about losing weight. People have seen kind of those radical transformations. They've dropped 40, 50 pounds, and you see them, and they look like a different person. And you ask them, well, what'd you do? You know what I typically don't hear? Oh, it was a seven-day program. That's all it was. It was just rice for seven days. No. Typically, it's not just a limited time period where it's say, hey, I did this type of diet for a short amount of time. They found that diets may lead to short-term short -term results, but in the long term, it really doesn't lead to the life. People go right back to the lifestyle that they were living before. Our, our faith, our practices as Christians should not just be contained to January. Come on now. 
We shouldn't just get really excited about prayer and fasting and you know, giving in December or towards the end of the year. These are things that should be a lifestyle to us. In other words, a way of living for us. See, prayer is not just something we do in our life when we're in need. There's a place for that. But prayer is a lifestyle. Can I tell you one of the beautiful things about prayer? Prayer is not just about getting out of the pit. When we have a lifestyle of, pray, uh, of prayer, it helps us avoid the pit. It's not just about, oh God, I pray because now I'm in a pit and I don't wanna be here. I, I, I'm in a continual basis of praying to God because I'm trying to avoid some pits that are trying to catch me, that are trying to trip me up, that are trying to get me stuck. See, I don't just give seasonally and say, well, you know, everyone kind of gives in Thanksgiving time, so let me give. No, no, no. I realize that God's called me to live a lifestyle of generosity where it just flows out of me because it flows out of my Father in heaven, right? See, God has called us to live a lifestyle, and Jesus is telling us, hey, when you, not if you, but when you pray, when you give, and when you fast. And that's why we are a church that fasts and pray and we give and Jesus is really telling us, you need to have this practice of fasting in your life. Do you know why? Do you know why Jesus is saying, this is vital to you walking with me? This is so important. This difficult, uncomfortable, challenging thing that you bring into your life of fasting. Man, I'm hungry. I'm, I'm hungry right now. But Jesus called us to this thing of putting food or something good to the side. Why? Because one of the reasons is because he wants us to be more dependent upon him. There's something about putting something good in your life that you enjoy to the side that just makes you a little bit more dependent upon God. I went on this fishing trip, and if you know me, I have literally never fished before in my life. You can take that up with my dad. We just weren't a fishing family. Like, we never went down to the stream and like, let's just go. We just didn't do that. And so my cousin asked me, he said, hey, do you want to go on a fishing trip with me and your other cousin in California? And I said, I said, sure. That sounds like fun. I've never done it before. He said, hey, hey, we'll show you how to do it. And so we go down to California, this is a couple of years ago, and I mean, I don't know, you always have this little image of what f fishing is gonna be in your mind, like just sitting on the dock and chilling. We got on a boat with 60 people, and we took off for an island in Mexico, I was like, wait, what is going on here? And for you guys that are fishers in here, for you guys that aren't like me, we got there, they gave us like five minutes of instructions and I realized I was on the advanced boat. So like grab your you know, fishing pole, okay, get out there, put the bait on it. I have never put bait on a hook in my entire life. And it's not like out here, you're catching these big fish. It's not like you're putting a little worm on there. You are putting fish on the hook to catch another fish. And if you're a fisher, you understand that you want the fish to be alive, so you pierce it through the nose, this is a little gross, so that it swims away and looks alive and doesn't just kind of flop there. I, for the first several hours, killed my fish by putting the hooks through, and I was like, why is everybody else catching things? And I'm trying to figure out this whole process of allowing my fish to look somewhat alive when it goes away, and when we catch the fish, or when everybody else was catching fish, you're supposed to, there's so many people that you're supposed to go over people and under people so that the lines don't get caught up. I'm telling you, nobody helped me. I was struggling. And the cousin who was like, yeah, I'm gonna help you. And I went up to him and I said, dude, can you help? I have no idea what I'm doing. Can you help? He's like, dude, I'm too busy catching fish, dude. I'll see you later. I'm like, I'm, 
I mean, I was so lost anytime my hook broke or this happened or that, I would have to go and say, uh, Mr. Uh, Fisherman Boat Guy who's running this thing, can you help me? Like, can you, put the, can you fix the hook? Because I don't even know how to tie it. See, when I was in that state of like, just didn't know, confused, lost, I was looking for somebody else's help. I didn't have the, the knowledge in my own mind. I didn't have the expertise to be able to do it. I was stuck there with a bunch of other people who had it figured out. And how much do we, how often do we feel like that in life? Like everybody else has it figured out and I'm stuck here in this situation. I don't have the answer or the power to change my, my problem. See, I think it's a good thing to need help. I think it's a good thing to not have the answer. I think it's a good thing to not have the power every once in a while to change a situation. I think it's a good, this is super crazy to say this, I think it's a good thing to feel weak every once in a while. Because when you don't have the answer for the problem that you're experiencing in your life, you don't have the solution, you don't have the knowledge to deal with it, you don't have the power to change one of your children's situations, you know what it forces you to do? It forces us to press into the one who does. When you're without answers, when you feel like you need help with a breakthrough in a situation, you need someone's heart to change, and you and I are out of answers, there's something that pushes us into this realm of being dependent of God, of feeling like I need answers, and if that means I gotta fast, I'm gonna fast. Throughout the Bible, we can connect and relate with godly men and women who didn't have the answers, who said, I, I need God's hand in this situation, so I'm gonna fast for an answer or a breakthrough. Moses fasted in Deuteronomy 9 for repentance and change in his own life and the hearts of the people. David fasted after he had sinned and his son was sick. David fasted before God, begging for the life of his son. I don't have the answer, God, I'm fasting and praying for you to change a situation I don't have the power for. Ezra fasted for humility and a safe journey in Ezra chapter eight for the people of Israel. The early church after Jesus left in Acts chapter 13 fasted and prayed and said, God, we need your direction. Where do you want us to go? And God led them to the place that he wanted them to go after what? A season of fasting and prayer. Esther, her people, the Jewish people, were about to be executed. And she would be, had been killed to go in front of the king, and yet she had the people and herself fast and pray before she went before the king, knowing that her life was in danger and could be taken away. See, throughout the Bible, there's people like me and you who were in situations that were so much bigger than them that they didn't have the answers for, that they needed a breakthrough, they needed a change. They needed a word. They needed direction. If you're feeling that way in your life, that's one of the reasons why God expects us to fast. He wants us to feel dependent. He wants us every once in a while to feel weak because in our weakness, we turn to the one who has strength. In our lack of understanding, we turn to the one who knows all. In our lack of power to transform a situation, we turn to the one who has the power to change hearts. It's not just dependence. God expects our fasting because of our desire for God. Psalms 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Those who know how God is good and how God is good. Those who, of us who have tasted God, part of fasting is not just to have an answer given or a breakthrough to happen, that's part of it, but part of it is just to press into God. Sometimes I go over to my parents' house and just going over to visit, my mom will be making dinner or something. And 
And on occasion, a couple times, I've gone over to my parents' house, not really planning to be around dinner time, but my mom's making dinner. I walk in the door. She's like, oh, good. I, I just made dinner, and I could make you a plate and put it right in front of you. You know, your dad's just about to eat or Grant's about to eat. And there's some times where I go, oh, I'm not that hungry. And she goes, do you got Chick-fil-A? I go, yeah, I just, I got a gift card and I had to, you know, I just. And there's sometimes where I've gone through a drive through earlier in the day and so I'm not really hungry. I'm not really hungry because I already ate and my stomach's full. And I love this quote by John Piper, theologian and pastor, because he talks to that. If you're in a season right now where you say, yeah, yeah, pastor, I feel you on the answer part, but I don't know if I necessarily feel you on that desire to press into God. Like if you knew this fast was just going to draw you closer to God, but not give you an answer, would you still press in? If you knew at the end of this, you would just have a, a closer relationship with God and, and, and want him more and desire him more, but your answers weren't given to you, your problem wasn't solved, would you still press in? And John Piper talks about this, about sometimes our stomach is full, and listen to what he says. If you don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it's not because you have drunk deeply and are satisfied. It is because you have nibbled so long at the table of the world. Your soul is stuffed with small things, and there is no room for the great. Sometimes that lack of a desire for God, but Piper's saying it is not because you've gone and you've really pressed in and gone as deep as you can go, because Piper's saying, hey, listen, when you go as deep as you could go, you're never fully satisfied. God, oh, you always want more. You want to go deeper with God. But sometimes it's because we're so full on that drive through meal that we got of the world that when there's a better meal waiting for us, we're not even able to eat it because we're so full in all the wrong things. Fasting is expected by God as being a part of our life, a lifestyle, because God wants us, he wants us every once in a while to get off the appetite of the world and desire to be hungry for God, to press in, to even after reading and worshiping and praying, feel like, I still want more. I, I want to know you deeper, God. I'm not satisfied with, with, with how I, I want to know you more. And that pleases God and is part of what fasting does in our life. God expects fasting because it creates a greater appetite for him. Number two, and we're moving ahead here. Let me pick up a little bit. Number two, not only does God expect our fast, but God sees my fast. Remember the passage we read at the, at the beginning of this that we're working through right now? The key words to listen to for here are sees, see, see sees, and seen. Jesus says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. The hypocrites fast so that they may be seen by others. When you fast, don't do it to be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father sees what's done in secret. Let me share a very profound truth that comes out of these verses here. Don't miss this. Very eye-opening to think about it this way. Oftentimes, we think about somebody who's like a hypocrite, right? The word. We think of when somebody says that, we think of somebody who says one thing and does another, right? Oh, I'm, you know, a great basketball player. And then you see him on the court and you're like, not so great. Sometimes we, it rubs us wrong a little bit, right? And we all have our failures, right? We can all attest to that. We all blow it. But someone who's like, oh, I'm so strong in my faith. And then you see them on Friday night partying and living this life. So you're like, well, seems a little, 
And so oftentimes we kind of associate a hypocrite as someone who says one thing and then lives opposite of that way that they say. But, but what's so interesting about this passage is that Jesus is talking about hypocrites, but the hypocrite and the righteous person or the seeker in this story, in this passage of scripture, they're doing the same thing. There's not a difference in the action. It's not like the hypocrite saying one thing and then living in a different action. The, the, the seeker, the person that's right in the eyes of God, who's opposite of a hypocrite, they're praying and the hypocrite is praying. Uh, the, the seeker is uh, uh, giving and they're generous and the hypocrite is giving too. Uh, the seeker is fasting and the hypocrite is fasting too. So in this passage, what's so interesting is that Jesus is saying it's not just someone that says one thing and does another thing. See, a hypocrite is, and the difference between a hypocrite and an authentic follower is not always the difference in action, hear me clearly, but the difference in motive. Jesus is saying in this passage, you see two people that are doing both good things, the right things, but how many of us know in here you can do the right things in the wrong way? How many of us here know you can do the right things with the wrong heart? I'll tell you a personal story. When we just went down not too long ago, I needed a break, man. This has been a tough year. And so we went down for a quick vacation uh, just a couple days down in Florida to soak up some sun and read a little bit, get away. And one of the nights I had uh, told my wife, I said, hey, we're going to go down and let's go to the jacuzzi when we get back. I was like, we're going to be back in Chicago. It's going to be cold. Let's soak up this water while we can. And we went down. Uh, we, we were playing. We got home real late. And um, she's like, you know, the jacuzzi closed at 10. We got there. And she said, hey, do you want to go? I said, ah, I'll go a little bit later. And right around late, late nines or after 10, she asked me again. She's like, do you want to go? I'm like, ah, man, it's close to 10. If I go in the jacuzzi, and then I get to get showered and all this type of stuff. And she was kind of upset at that point. I'm just showing you. I'm just being transparent. She was, I'm learning marriage. I'm, I'm new to it. She was a little bit upset at that point. And she was, you know, like, okay, well, you said you were going to do it, and now we're not doing it, and I'm not vibing with that. And so I was like, fine, you know, let's do it. Let's go. I mean, I, I don't really want to. If you're asking me, I don't really want to, but let's go down to the jacuzzi. It's late. I don't come back, take a shower. And, and, and she goes, I don't want to do it anymore. Listen, family. Sometimes I'm, I am trying to learn sometimes. I'm like, I, woman, help me here. I said, I'm confused. You want me to go down to the jacuzzi with you, and then I tell you I'll go down to the jacuzzi with you, and then you say you don't want to go down to the jacuzzi. My male brain doesn't work like that. I don't understand what you're telling me. Do you want to go or not go? Because I'm confused. And she said this thing. <laughs> What she said to me was really interesting because the idea of what she said, I don't remember exactly how she said it. Oh, I do. No, I do. Never mind. <laughs> Some things you can't forget. This is how she said it. And tell me if you can relate, right? I'm new marriage over here. She said, I want you to want to go. <laughs> I'm growing. She said, I want you to want to go. And I'm like, I'm just willing to go. I don't want to go, but I'm willing to go because I love you. She said, no, I want you to want to go. See, I was thinking about that in the context of doing the right things with the wrong heart. And I was thinking what my wife wanted is she didn't just want my actions. My, what my wife wanted, she, she wanted my heart. She, she, just, she didn't just want me to go down just to do it. She wanted me to want to go down because she wanted my heart. She said, I want you to be into this. I don't want you to just do the right thing because you know it's the right thing. I want you to do the right thing because you're into it and you love me and you want to spend time with me. I want you to do it not just the right thing with the wrong heart. I want you to do the right thing with the right heart. And our motives behind our actions matter to people. And you know who they really matter to? They really matter to God. 
Because it's not just about, well, I pray God. Thank you so much for this meal. You're so good, God. I love you. I love you. I love you. Amen. Amen. It's not just abstaining from food to say, God, I'm really suffering. My stomach's ripping apart right now. I hope you love me. I gave you a lot of money, God. It's really, I don't even really want to do it, but I gave you a lot. That's not the heart that God is looking for. In scripture, it says he looks for a what? Joyful, cheerful giver. He's not just looking for someone that's going to give. Say, ah, here it is. I'm giving kind of reluctantly. He wants someone who has his same heart, not just the right action, but the right heart, the right motive, the right desire behind it. And during a fast, God's not just looking and saying, are you abstaining from something? God's saying, what's the heart and the motive? motive that you're bringing into this fast what's the harm I'm glad you're doing the right thing but I want you to do the right thing with the right heart in our walk with Jesus sometimes we can do the right thing and have lost our heart in it all I know this is right God so I'm going to do it but I don't really feel like doing it And we fast, not so that other people can see us like hypocrites, not just because everybody else is doing it, yeah, we gotta do it. But we fast and do the right thing, hopefully with the right heart, saying, God, I want you to refine me in this time of fasting. I want you to humble me. I want you to draw me near, God. I don't just have a list of demands. There's some things I want, God, but what I really want is you. And you know what? Sometimes I prayed honestly, God, I'm doing the right thing, but I don't have that fire right now. I don't have that passion. I don't feel like pressing in. And I want you to change that in me because I don't want to do the right thing without the right heart. So would you stir up a fire in me, God? Would you draw me close? Would you change my heart? Because I I don't want to feel this way and just do the right things without the right heart. Because I know more importantly than everybody else knowing I'm doing this or that, you tell me to do in secret because you're the one who's really watching. And I don't wanna be a phony or fake or put it on and not really do, I, I wanna do it, but I wanna do it with a heart that you see from heaven and you are so pleased with. The fasting that makes a difference is one done for the Father's eyes. He sees you during this fast and he sees what you do in secret. And that doesn't have to be a bad thing. That's an amazing thing. When you know you're pressing into God, that he's watching. When you know that you're struggling during this fast, and yet he's looking at your heart, and you're like, God, I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling, but I'm pressing in because I want you more. That pleases God. And last but not least, let's jump into the final one. The third reason to finish this fast wrong is not only because he sees us, even though that alone is enough or that he expects it. But the third, and this is so encouraging, it finishes off with such an exciting part of this entire passage. It's because God, write this down, number three, God rewards my fast. God rewards our fasting. I think it was last year, I'd have to look back on Instagram because I recorded it. But I believe it was last year that it was like one of those like negative 40 days with the wind chill. I think it was last year. It was the year, year before. And being the good brother that I am, I decided it was like one of those where you like throw the water up and it like, you know, vaporizes right away and comes smoke. Well, we got tired of doing that. So... I told my brother, I said, how much do I have to pay you to run out in your chonies and jump in that snow? And I said, I want a full 360 in the snow. Like if I'm paying, I want it to be good. And so after a little bit of negotiating, you know, this, that, I don't even remember what I paid him, but I had a bunch of gift cards that I wasn't using. And I said, okay, so this is the deal. And he's like, okay, this is the deal, I accept, you know, and I gave him a bunch of gift cards, and my mom wasn't there, that's why this was able to happen, and uh, my brother stripped down, and we had a towel or a blanket ready for him, 
There's a video of this on Instagram. He, he ran out, almost slipped and wiped out. So that's amazing. But then he ran into the snow, jumped full commit into the snow, did a full 360 and came back screaming to the house. Ah! Slammed the door closed, put a blanket over him and was like, that is the coldest. He's like two feet out, I was about to quit. I was about to quit. But you know what? A little reward, a little gift card. He's thinking about the meal he's gonna get afterwards. Think about what he's gonna buy on Amazon. A little reward goes a long way in motivating us and pushing us to do the hard things, right? Or maybe even the things we don't wanna do. And we don't have to think of reward as a bad way. Well, I just gotta, I just gotta press into God and just want God and I can't, no, 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 it's not about, no, 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 it's, it's okay. Jesus is saying, yo, I reward my followers. Like that's part of the package that I'm providing. Like not only do I see you and expect it, but I'm also giving you a reward when you do this in the right way, when you do it with the right motive, when you do it with the right heart, I, I am going to reward you for pressing into me. And I, and I believe those rewards come in all different types of ways. I've even experienced this. Sometimes that reward comes through a breakthrough in your life that you've been praying for. Because I've experienced one of those on this fast. Sometimes it comes into your life as a word into your life. That God gives you something that's gonna guide you in your life or, or be something that gives you wisdom and clarity for the next season. Sometimes I believe just God rewards you with a greater love in your life or a greater wisdom or a greater joy. Sometimes God rewards in a generous way when we press in in the right way. And as we press in as a church in this last week together, can I tell you, that's encouraging. That should motivate you. That should help you as we push through this last and final week. Whether you fasted the whole time with us or are starting this last week, know that your God rewards us when we press in and seek. And listen to what it says. If you, if you don't believe me, listen to this verse. Hebrews eleven six. And without faith, it is impossible to please God for whoever, oh, this is so good, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. It's hard to draw near to God if you don't believe he exists. And number two, that he rewards those who seek him. And I know there's people in here, in this room, come on. I know there's people in this room who have been seeking and pressing into God with me. And let me just encourage you. If you feel like you're on the edge, if you feel like you're gonna quit, if you need to step back into this fast, let me encourage you. God rewards those who seek him. You want the breakthrough, you want the change, you want the fire, start seeking him with the right motives, start pressing in. And when we press in as a church together to almighty God, God can't help but reward the person that seeks him. There's something that draws God in, attracts God when he sees someone saying, I'm not gonna quit, I'm not gonna give in, I'm not gonna stop, I am going to seek. And I know what's on the other side of that is better than experiencing whatever I'm abstaining from. In this last week, and if you haven't felt the temptation, if you haven't felt the urge to quit, if you haven't started this fast, let me tell you, it's worth it. The Bible says there are some things that only happen during fasting and prayer. There are certain demons that only get cast out with fasting and prayer. There are certain things that only happen through fasting and prayer. There are certain breakthroughs in your life that will only happen through fasting and prayer.